Coming up, an addict's last chance at life and a young man's journey of finding freedom from fear. Well, welcome to 700 Club Canada. I'm so glad that you joined us today. You know, I want to share a recent report about the effect of COVID-19 on youth, specifically in the area of mental health. Studies are showing that the mental health of children and youth has been affected by these restrictions and lockdowns. And, you know, many children sadly are developing anxiety and depression and even losing their purpose in life. See, a lack of physical activity and even just recreational fun, it has a great impact on kids. Families and caretakers are encouraged to get kids outside and keep them active. Uh, we got a trampoline, can I just say, in our backyard, and my little ones out there and myself, because, you know, Gamma has to go on the trampoline, it is a great workout and good fresh air. You know, even letting kids try new things will help their mental health and well-being. Just encourage kids today by telling them never to give up because when we learn resilience in difficult times, and I believe this generation, the hope for them is that they'll be strong and resilient because of the things that they've really had to endure during this difficult season. So speak into your kid's life. This is Mental Health Awareness Week in Canada. And we just want to encourage you, like talk to your children, talk to your grandchildren, pray with them and for them. And if they need help, remember there's no problem too big for God. Well, on today's program, Dr. Mary Lynn tackles the subject of addiction, bringing her many years of experience as a psychologist to the program. And you'll see how a Catholic priest out hustled a con man and introduced him to God. It's pretty amazing. But first, a random encounter at a bus stop not only saves Anisha's life, but gives her a new one. Watch this. My childhood, it was abuse. If I could sum it up in one word, uh, mental, emotional, spiritual, psychological, sexual abuse. Anisha Freeman had an absent father and a mother with paranoid schizophrenia. I started um, developing a belief system that compared to other people, there was something wrong with me. Because of her mental illness, Anisha's mother forced her children to read the Bible and pray on their knees for hours on end. I had a personal relationship with God, but it was distorted. I had asked God to come into my heart when I was like seven or eight, but, and I told my mom, and I was so happy, but she uh, operated, she was a religious fanatic, and she operated out of a legalistic concept of God. Uh, it was a conditional relationship. I had to be perfect. By the time I had became an adolescent, I was like, dude, why try? By high school, Anisha found solace in drugs and alcohol. Her grades dropped as she looked for a way to pay for her addictions. When I was 13, I looked like I was 21 or 22. I resembled an adult uh, woman. I didn't really think I was prostituting then. I didn't think that's what, it, that's what it was, but that's what it was. I was exchanging sexual services for drugs and alcohol. Anisha ran from her home life after her high school graduation. I was living in Chicago when, my, when the addiction kicked into high gear. Um, I had just been, I had been smoking marijuana, uh, drinking alcohol, occasionally snorting cocaine, but it only lasted for three minutes. And it cost $25 to feel like that for three minutes. I stopped paying bills, all of my money started going to cocaine. The addiction got so bad till I went back to Detroit and that's when I got introduced to the crack cocaine subculture. And I started hanging out in crack houses. She stayed on the streets for 12 years the victim of physical beatings and rapes. I could see evil. Um, I met evil there. I mean, I knew evil existed, but in those crack dens, I saw evil on an entirely different light. There are so many times when I have had pistols to my head, literally pistols to my head, or somebody who had their hands around my throat choking me. That, that, go, that goes along with prostituting and living and being in crack houses and owing dope boys money. Oh, I felt convicted. I knew what I was doing. Some of the things I were engaging in was an abomination to God. I knew that, you know, but, the, but the, the drugs, I had to have the drugs. Anisha couldn't handle her life of addiction anymore. She went outside to the nearest bus stop. But I had no plans to get on a bus. 
I was going to commit suicide. Um, I was timing my leap into the street. I was just real resigned in my spirit. I had made up my mind, I can't live like this anymore. And a man was walking behind me, and he stopped. I didn't see him until he said something. That's what made me turn around and look at him. He said, don't you dare. <laughs> and I turned around, he said, don't you dare give up. And I believe that man was an angel. I don't know if he was or if he just somebody God used right then and that point because I was getting ready to leave here. <laughs> and I'm like, wow, you mean like, there's a God up there that cares whether or not a prostitute, crack addict is getting ready to take her life. Shortly after that day at the bus stop, Anisha made the decision to let God change her life. I was walking away from a crack motel, and I, f I heard God in my spirit. He, it wasn't an audible voice. It was, it was deep in my spirit. I heard God say, choose you this day who you will serve. And it's like he had, not only had he showed me himself, he had showed me Satan's kingdom uncut and raw. And I knew right then in my spirit that if I didn't leave at that particular moment, I would die there. And that was August the 7th of the year 2000, and I have not used another drug, any type of mood-altering, mind-altering substance, including alcohol. I have used nothing since that day. Anisha started going to church and completed several addiction programs. The cross means so much to me. It, it's, it, means, that, it means that I have access now. He let me know, I love you, when even though you're sin, and I don't, I don't love your sin, but I love you. And he saved me, and he's given me a life that is beyond anything I could have imagined. In the last 10 years, Anisha has completed three degrees, including an MBA. Today, she's a certified addictions counselor and has developed a citywide program to help prostitutes get off the streets. I would say that if you think you're too far, that that is a lie straight from the pit of hell. No matter what you've done, God can turn your life around. And he's not going to just turn it around a little bit. He can turn it all around till you, till you don't even recognize your life. Well, that's it. He can turn your life completely around to the point that you don't even recognize your life. I've seen God do this so many times. In fact, just recently, a young man named Jake was baptized in our hot tub. And I can tell you, he's a completely different person. About a year and a half ago, I got a message from his mom and we received many messages from parents all over the world because we've shared our family story. And we committed to praying for Jake. And we were praying for Jake for a year and a half. I would get messages every once in a while about just he was in a bad place or they'd seen a breakthrough, or but just this constant prayer journey. Well, recently, she reached out to my son, Curtis, and Jake, Curtis had gone to meet with Jake. Well, Jake wasn't ready to give up, or he wasn't ready to give up his lifestyle to follow Jesus wholeheartedly. But I'll tell you, he came to the end of himself and this is what God does. And literally a message from his mom that he was talking suicidal thoughts. Jake reached out and messaged Curtis. My son met with him. That young man was delivered. He was set free. He was baptized. He's all in to follow Jesus. I can tell you, it is like night and day seeing where Jake was at and where he is. And all it takes is a moment of surrender. See, John 10, 10 says, the thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy, but I've come that they may have life and have it to the full. God wants you to be all in. You can't do halfway in with Jesus. You gotta be all in. That's why we baptize, we dunk people under the water. You're all in and you come up and you live a new life. You can be free indeed. This is a wonderful resource. Jake's story I know is speaking to someone today. In fact, Tina sent a request in and she said, pray for me and my husband. We're going through a rough time with our adult son. We need strength and wisdom to make good decisions. Well, I'm just gonna tell you, I'm gonna pause right now and pray for their adult son, but for there's other people watching, and I know there's a lot of Jakes out there. Number one, reach out for prayer. Jake's mom did the right thing. And then number two, pray and ask God to deliver your child. The enemy's schemes does not need to prosper in your kid's life. 
Jesus, we bring this young man to you, and I pray in the mighty and powerful name of Jesus that you would go get him, that he would surrender himself to your loving kindness, that you would deliver him of the oppression of the enemy and the demonic, that you would set him free, and that this family could see such a miracle of healing. Go do it again, Jesus. Go do it again. Amen. That prayer was for you. If you want this resource, give us a call, 1-855-759-0700, or go to 700club.ca. We'd love to hear from you. Up next, Dr. Mary with tips to equip anyone struggling with addiction. Someone should download the CBN Family app to get an easy view at all of CBN's media. Having access easily to that faith-based content is so invaluable. This is a great way I could take that with me on the go, you know? This app is really easy to use. My favorite feature is the fact that you can look at like the different like feeds, like the news, animations. This app has exactly what you're looking for as far as Christian values go. Nobody starts out intending to develop an addiction, but unfortunately, many people get caught in its snare. Research actually used to believe that people who developed addictions were somehow morally flawed or lacking in willpower. But today, scientists believe that addiction is a chronic disease that over time actually changes both the brain structure and the function. Just as cardiovascular disease damages the heart, addiction hijacks the brain. There's no single cause of addiction, and it can be hard to figure out why some people become addicted and others don't. Researchers believe that there are several factors that can influence the development of addiction. There appears to be a genetic link to addiction. So if your parents or other family members have struggled with or are struggling with addiction, you do have a higher statistical chance of developing an addiction too. But sometimes it's just some traumatic childhood experiences, emotional or physical or sexual abuse that can trigger addiction when people seek comfort or an escape from the pain of past experiences. And young adults may sometimes have friends who use alcohol and other drugs and peer influence can lead to experimenting with addictive substances. Addictions are also more common in people with other mental health issues such as depression or anxiety. It could be that people with mental health issues use addictive substances or activities to help them feel better. But in fact, unfortunately, the opposite happens. Now some people, and this can be fairly common, may actually turn to substances or activities to relieve stress or help them cope with certain situations and feelings. In fact, some research believe that addicts abuse alcohol or other substances to protect themselves against overwhelming anxiety and other painful emotions such as loneliness and, dep loneliness and depression. If your loved one is struggling with addiction, it's very important that you're willing to face the truth that this may be a little bit more serious than they're letting on. Hoping that they'll grow out of it or somehow be delivered from it isn't always the best solution. Yes, Jesus will sometimes deliver people from their addictions, but if they don't examine some of the underlying root causes of their addictions in the first place, they may find themselves with other unhealthy patterns of dependence, even if they've managed to kick their original addiction. They're gonna often need professional help to assess them and recommend treatment options. Now, if they refuse to get professional help, then you go seek help. You can get support on how to set boundaries, how to draw a line in the sand, and how to refuse to enable their bad choices. While changing their outward behavior is an important part of overcoming addictions, it's really important to understand the internal triggers that led to the addiction in the first place. So if your loved one is trying to overcome their addiction by just sheer determination and just gritting their teeth to stop their addictive behavior without dealing with the underlying issues or pain or dysfunction, they might find themselves relapsing. Many times people with addictions will refuse to admit that they have a problem. And so families can get into this dysfunctional dance where they try to help. Their loved one gets into trouble, they step in to try to help, and the addicts are clean for a while, but then they start using again, and on and on the cycle goes. The whole family's life just becomes wrapped around after one crisis after another. And in our fear for their safety, we can sometimes interfere with the hard lessons that our loved ones need to learn to turn away from their bad choices. One of the hardest things we may have to do is watch them hit rock bottom. We might have to let them go their way so that when the consequences of their choices becomes unbearable for them, they finally come to their senses. I know it can feel like you're abandoning your loved one, but you're actually doing the most loving thing 
to ensure that they're able to finally take responsibility for their own choices and that they grow through their mistakes. And for those of us who are Christ followers, this can be a time of intense faith building as you learn to release to God the care and well-being of your loved one. If you can just focus on the truth that God loves them more than you do, He's sovereign, and He has promised to redeem everything for good in their lives, even their worst mistakes when they turn back to God, then perhaps you can choose to hold on to hope. I strongly encourage you, connect with other families in your church or community who have walked in your shoes. They can help give you a sense of hope and strength during this part of your journey. And if you're the one suffering from an addiction, please, no shame or condemnation, get some help. I'm Dr. Lynn. I lived a rough and tumble life. I was always a hustle, was always manipulative just to get what I wanted and I did whatever I had to to get it. It was on the rough streets of a Boston neighborhood where Jim Wahlberg learned the art of the hustle. Jim was the middle of nine kids to hardworking parents trying to give their children a better life. We had nothing, our neighbors had nothing, and we were happy. Then they moved into a middle-class neighborhood when Jim was eight, and he realized just how poor his family was. Right away, I felt different. I felt less than. So I started taking things that I didn't that didn't belong to me so that I could try to live up to the way they got to live. Hustling, stealing, and running from police soon became a way of life. Jim was only 10 the first time he was arrested. He would spend his teen years in and out of juvie and slowly becoming dependent on drugs and alcohol. I would drink to try to get rid of the shame and those feelings of self-loathing. It's all rooted in fear. Fear of what you think of me, fear of not being good enough. Then at 17, Jim found himself in prison where he had served five years for armed robbery. The time behind bars had changed nothing. I start drinking alcohol under the pretense of I'm celebrating, right? But what I, I wasn't celebrating, I was medicating myself. I was trying to soothe that fear, that uncomfortability. I was the most dangerous I had ever been. I was the most afraid I had ever been. I was in the worst mental condition I had ever been in my entire life. The next six months would be a substance-induced blur for Jim, causing him to have blackouts. One morning, he came to in a jail cell covered in his own blood. He had broken into a police officer's house and was now charged with home invasion, which carried a life sentence. I felt completely defeated and broken. Um, and I felt resigned to the fact that this was the way my life was gonna be forever. My heart was, was a stone. Jim would only receive six to nine years after the officer whose home he had invaded advocated for a lighter sentence. Back in prison, he began attending self-help groups for the sole purpose of reducing his time. It was part of that hustle. It's just trying to create the illusion that I was getting better in prison and always thinking when I get out, I'll use again. Jim's act was so convincing, he was leading 12-step programs and self-help groups within a year. It was then Jim started working as the chapel custodian, where the prison's Catholic priest, Father Freitas, started striking up conversations with him. He had one goal in mind to evangelize, right? To bring me home to God. And so he was hustling me. After asking Jim several times to attend mass, Father Freitas tried a different tactic. And he said, listen, I need you to clean the chapel after the vigil mass. So why don't you just come to the vigil mass? He says, we have a special visitor coming in two weeks. And I'm like, yeah, who's that? And he said, uh, Mother Teresa is coming to this prison. And I was like, wow, that's fantastic. Who's Mother Teresa? he would soon find out. On June 4, 1988, Mother Teresa spoke to the prisoners at the Massachusetts Correctional Institution in Concord. And she said, you're more than the crimes that you've committed to be here. You're more than your prison ID number. You're a child of God. Many were inspired by that message of a loving God. Inmate 44563 was one of them. God, help me to be the person that you want me to be. I can't continue to be this person. Help me to be free of this life. I felt the presence of God in my heart. 
Now depending on God, Jim studied the Bible and was able to curb his addictions. In 1990, after serving only three years, Jim was released for good behavior. I was weak in my relationship with God, and I was just a weak human being. And God got further and further away. I said, thank you, I'll take it from here. Over the next two decades, Jim got married, had three kids, and became the executive director of the Mark Wahlberg Youth Foundation for Inner City Kids. Despite his success, Jim was still unfulfilled and drifting further from God. When you feel his presence and you walk away from it, there's guilt, there's shame, but there's also a sort of a sense that you, it'll never happen for you again. My daughter, who was 12 at the time, Kyra, came to me and she said, Daddy, I want you to be happy. I want you to know Jesus. At the urging of his family and his daughter, Jim agreed to go to a Christian men's retreat. God started to reveal himself to me again, and he started to melt away the ice that was my heart. I mean, I started crying and I couldn't stop, right? I was just, I was just so overwhelmed, and I just felt so at peace. That reignited Jim's faith and passion to serve Christ and others. Now he has a successful podcast and studio working to bring awareness to the far-reaching effects of addiction. Hey guys, Jim Walbert here from The Bottom Line. And now his hustle is to lead others to Christ. I'm trying to talk people into this life that is second to none, this life of a feeling Christ's presence in your life. When you open your heart, man, God's presence will just jump right in. God is for us. Verses of salvation, peace, and victory. Let the Word of God transform you as you listen to... There is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. This all-new audio recording by Pat Robertson features powerful selections from the Book of Romans. Through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. God is for us. Available now. Do you know that you are fully and unconditionally accepted by God? You see, I knew in my head that God accepted and loved me unconditionally, but the reality was I was afraid God accepted everyone but me. See, God began to show me that I associated my performance with my acceptability. Mm -hmm. Here's what I wrongly believed. If I'm good, I'm acceptable. If I help people, if I'm a blessing instead of a burden, well, then I'm accepted. But if I fail, if I blow it or mess up, then I feel like a reject, which means not acceptable to me, to others, and certainly not to God. You see, my skewed belief was I was acceptable only when I was at the top of my game. Clearly, I was basing my acceptance on my performance. And Jesus tells us that he accepts us not based on what we do or have done but what he has done, that's it, full stop. We are fully accepted by God when we put our faith in what Jesus did for us. His death and resurrection took care of our sin and anything that made us unacceptable to God. It removed any barriers to us being fully accepted by God, no matter what we've done, good or bad. See, Jesus says your acceptability is not based on your failure or past. Your acceptability is not based on your success or virtues. Your acceptability is not based on what you do, what you did, what you haven't done, what you should have done, or what you wish you'd done. Your acceptability is based on who God is and what he's done for you. Listen to what Jeremiah 3, 31, 3 says that God loves us with an everlasting, never fail kind of love. I have loved you, my people, with an everlasting love, with unfailing love. I've drawn you to myself. And John 1, 12 tells us that we're accepted as a child of God, as a member of his family. It says, but to all who believed him and accepted him, he gave the right to become children of God. Talk about accepted. You know, lots of us struggle. 
with really believing that we're accepted to and accepted by God. We believe lies that we're not good enough, smart enough, or spiritual enough, all lies. We are accepted, not because of what we do or don't do. We are accepted not because of how we succeed or even if we're good. We are accepted not because of who we are, but because of who God is and what Jesus has done for us. If you feel invisible, it may be because deep down you've never really embraced the truth about yourself, that you are accepted by God, admired by Him, and have His full and unconditional love. When you accept Christ, He accepts you. You may sometimes feel rejected, but how you feel is not who you are. You are acceptable, accepted, and no exceptions. And that's courageous living. I hope you've heard loud and clear today that God cares for you. Yes, you, he loves you. He's with you, he's for you. He sees everything that you're going through. He sees everything your family's going through and he cares. All we encourage you to do is call out to him and if you need support, call us. We're here for you, 1-855-759-0700, 24-7. We have trusted prayer partners on the line who will listen to you and pray with you and remind you of how much God cares for you. Or go to 700club.ca and, and tell us, give us your prayer request. Share with us even there and we will pray for them. I wanna thank you so much to those who partner with us. And for those who are monthly givers, monthly partners, we have a wonderful teaching for you. It's actually the reading of the book of Romans uh, done by Pat Robertson. It's called God is for us. Do you need to hear this truth today? If you join us as a monthly partner, we'll send you that teaching or that recording of the book of Romans. It's so wonderful to just have your mind washed with scripture. I love Genesis 28, 15. It says, I'm with you. I will watch over you wherever you go. And I will bring you back to this land. I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. See, that's the God who loves us, who's with us, who takes care of us. You can trust him. Give us a call if you need support today. We love you too. To contact us, visit 700club.ca. A young woman helping former African child soldiers and a young man forced to cut off his arm to save his life. 